Greetings from Taft Street Baptist Church. The title of this message is The Spice Laden Mountains. It comes to us from the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. Once again, The Spice Laden Mountains, and it's from the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. It's the last teaching in this series on the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. I'll go ahead and read the text, then we'll pray. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Under the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. O you who dwell in the gardens with companions, listening for your voice, let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains. Of spices. Let's pray. Lord God, as we end this series, I just pray that you would impart something to us through your word, Lord God. And we know that your word does not return back unto you void. So, Lord, I just pray that you'd bless this teaching, bless the teaching of your word, and pray. May all those who are listening receive something from you during this uh, teaching, Lord. May they receive from your word. I ask for this, Lord God. I pray that they put it into practice, whatever they've learned as well. Please bless them. Please bless this entire teaching. And it can only be done by your power, Lord God. For it's not by might, nor is it by power, but it's by your spirit, Lord. It's not by our power. It's not by our might. It's not by our flesh. It's by your power. It's by your grace. It's by your strength. And you'll get the glory for it. It's by the power of your Spirit. We pray for all these things, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll go ahead and read the first two verses again, then we'll explore this text. We'll go on the adventure of expounding on this marvelous set of verses. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. The wish that the shepherd were like a brother involves the desire to, that the shepherdess, um, the wish for her that the shepherd was like a brother to her involves the desire to express her love and affection to him in an open manner. An older sister in that culture would, of course, have freedom to love in a sisterly way her little brother without criticism from the community. Obviously, she's not saying she wishes the shepherd were literally her brother, of course, but like one that she may express her love towards him more freely. 
This expression in the second verse includes bringing him into her mother's house where she would give him spiced wine to drink, the juice of her pomegranate. This probably refers to the giving of herself to the young man in a sexual manner. Let's go ahead to verses 3 through 4. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love into it pleases. The young couple have been waiting to engage in lovemaking for some time. She is imagining being with the man one last time before she will really, truly be with him before his left hand is under her head. Their longings and desires will soon be fulfilled. They have been faithful. They've been faithful to retain their virginity. And even though I don't think they've been entirely patient in waiting, I don't think so. They did, by God's grace, refrain from giving in to the temptation to have sex before marriage. The woman, for the last time, speaks to the chorus, the daughters of Jerusalem, encouraging herself to exhibit restraint, which she does. She might also be advising the chorus of young women to help her to be responsible in this area, to keep her accountable. Right down to the end, she is fighting to maintain purity. The next verse indicates marriage and consummation. Let's read. It's not stated directly or explicitly, but let's go ahead and read verse 5. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Under the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Now, regarding the first half of this verse, it is possible that the chorus of young women are speaking. The question is an expression regarding the arrival of the shepherdess. The word leaning here suggests the kind of intimacy associated with marriage. The wedding has taken place and they are now together. The young woman, starting with the word under, begins to speak again. In the song, natural surroundings have, at least in part, been associated with intimacy, and the apple tree here evokes that atmosphere and suggests sexual intimacy. The reference to the woman awakening the man in this verse refers to con consummation. It is also here where the reference to children is mentioned, which serves to underscore the truth that consummation is referred to with the word awaken. Marriage is the right, proper, and biblical context for sex and having children to occur. In the Song of Solomon, the pleasures of sex is more prominent than the normal outcome following the fulfillment of erotic longings and desires, namely children, which are a blessing from the Lord. Let's go ahead to verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for your love, for love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. The seal referred to here is probably from a stamp and could be attached to a band and used as a necklace dangling over the heart or worn over the arm. I might be wrong, but I don't think she is telling him to literally make some piece of jewelry symbolic of their love, but expressing the desire that he would regard her in the romantic sense as totally his and by way of implication that he would be hers, that they would, in a loving sense, own each other. They are now married, and it is proper for couples to feel this way for each other. They are committed to protecting their marriage. No intruders were allowed to enter therein. It is understood that death is a powerful experience, right? It says here that love is strong as death, but love is just as strong. Regarding jealousy, the kind that is referred to here is not, normally we think, when we think of jealousy, we think of a certain kind of thing, which is petty and immature. But the jealousy that is referred to here is not the selfish kind that manifests itself in sinful behavior, but the kind that reveals itself in a loving, in a zealous, a determined posture to preserve the unity, the purity and sanctity of marriage. This kind of fiery, flashing, holy passion can only come from God. Regarding the pure and holy form of jealousy, God perfectly exhibits it. I'm going to go ahead and read a verse in relation to that from Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's go ahead to verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Love is so powerful that floods cannot drown the fire of love. Imagine the fire of love, floods trying to quench its fire, but they can't do it because it's so powerful. After voluminous waters have done their worst to quench it, it still burns. In the song, we see that the couple had to endear various hindrances and barriers to their love. In their true love for each other, they are able, by God's grace, to overcome the obstacles that assailed them. I'm sure many of us in our own experience can testify to this truth. True love is a gift from God. Also, love is something that money cannot purchase. Even a modicum of love cannot be purchased by a large sum of money. Let's go to chapter 8, verses 8 through 9. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Now, in these two verses, the young woman's brothers are speaking. They speak of their little, little sister as having no breasts, which is a way of saying she's not mature enough to be married. It's basically what their brother is saying. You're not mature enough yet to be married. They then ask a question, revealing their concern on the day when she is to marry. The reference to her as a wall is metaphorical for that of a virgin. She is like a wall in the sense that prior to marriage, she has not sexually opened herself up to a man. She's blocked off. If she retains her virginity, the battlement of silver the brothers will then build on her metaphorically suggests they will honor her. They will honor her. On the other hand, if the young woman is a door, that is, she has opened herself up sexually to men, they will try and protect her. They'll try and restrain her from from continuing to engage in sexual immorality. They will enclose her with boards of cedar, a metaphor involving strong efforts by the brothers to try and curb any sinful behavior. Let's go to verse 10. I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Now the young woman here responds to her brothers by asserting that she is a virgin, she is, a, you know, that she was a wall. She also tells her brothers they are wrong. She is mature enough to be married. Her breasts were like towers. The reference to her finding peace involve, involves the kind of peaceful, harmonious fulfillment that can, that can be found in a good marriage. Ultimately, of course, marriage can never fulfill us. Only Jesus Christ can. But marriage, when conducted well, that is in accordance with Scripture, does, by God's grace, provide various blessings to husbands and wives. Let's go into verses 11 through 12. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one is to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. The young woman continues speaking in this set of verses. King Solomon is able to make a lot of money off of his literal vineyard. But the woman's metaphorical vineyard, that is her sexuality, cannot be purchased for money. It is something she gives to her husband freely. Once again, the young man, the shepherd who is now her husband, is referred to here as royalty, as she's done in the past. Let's go to verse 13. O you who dwell in the gardens, with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. In this verse, the shepherd tells the one dwelling in the gardens, that is, the young woman who is with companions, possibly her brothers, that he desires to hear her voice. In other words, he wants to be alone with her. And let's go to verse 14. 
Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. She responds here by inviting him to be swift to be with her, that they may delight and enjoy themselves on the mountains of spices. Rather than just one fragrant mountain to scale together, there's a whole range of them. It says mountains of spices. Many delightful experiences await them in their marriage, including lovemaking. On the new heavens and the new earth, believers will learn more and more about the greatness of the triune God throughout eternity. God is inexhaustible. There will be an infinite number of rich, fragrant mountains to experience, for he is eternal and and he's inexhaustible. And that really encourages us that the new heavens and the new earth, being with the Lord forever, awaits us as we go through the trials, the various tribulations on earth. It's encouraging to us that we'll have that We'll be perfect, we'll be glorified, we'll be with the Lord forever, and we'll spend an eternity getting to know more about the triune God who redeemed us, who saved us, who bought us, who sealed us, who adopted us into his family, and who loves us. And uh, it'll be, it's encouraging. It's very encouraging. So please be encouraged. And uh, hopefully this series on the Song of Solomon proved to be a blessing and edifying to you. I hope it did. By if it did, it's, you know, all the good that occurred through this teaching series was by God's grace and power, and he gets the glory for it. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord God, for this book, the Song of Solomon, which is such high and exalted language. And there's, there's much to learn here as we um, dive into it and dig into it. Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that we just, that we would... Remember those lessons, this, the, the loving way to speak and the, the various things that we've heard and, the, re, and the, um, the encouragement to retain sexual purity before marriage and all the other lessons along the way. I pray that we'd remember them, we'd apply them, and that we would live before your face in a manner that pleases you. I pray that we would be holy, for you are holy, I pray that we'd hate what you hate and love what you love insofar as you've given us that capacity. And I pray, Lord God, that our lives would serve to bring you glory. This can only be done by your power. It's by your grace, and you'll get the glory for it. We ask for all these things, Father, in the name of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen.